tonight expelled from office. We called for you all to ban assault weapons, and you respond with an assault on democracy. The breaking news out of Tennessee after the state legislature took the rare move to oust at least one Democratic lawmaker, why and the precedence that sets up ahead. Plus, you know, it breaks my heart to know that there are kids growing up that see only the highlight reels that see only the, you know, manufactured, polished, Hollywood, uh, you know, idyllic bodies. And it's just not realistic. It's a rarely discussed condition impacting men across the country. In tonight's prime focus, we bring you the very human stories behind bigorexia and how Hollywood and social media have had a role in perpetuating the problem. And... Oh, my God. It's you. Oh, that's me? Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate this so much, OK? He became a smash success with his show Dave in 2020. The actor, rapper, director, and writer behind that massive hit, Dave Bird, joins to talk about how he went from YouTuber to TV star. Hey, and good evening, everyone. I'm Trevor Alden for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following all those stories and much more, including how the Supreme Court is now wading into the fight over trans athletes in sports, plus violence reaching a tipping point in the Middle East after Israeli forces stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque multiple nights this week during Ramadan, the rockets now being fired into Gaza, and Jeremy Renner speaking out about his hard-fought recovery in an emotional sit-down interview with Diane Sawyer will bring you what he is now saying. Our correspondents are fanned across the country covering those stories and more for us tonight. And we begin with the tensions boiling over for lawmakers in Tennessee after that mass shooting at the Covenant School in Nashville. The state legislature has been debating all day over whether or not to expel three Democratic lawmakers after they protested for gun control on the floor of the chamber. Now, one of those lawmakers likened today's vote to a political lynching. The Republican leader compared this nonviolent protest by Representatives Justin Jones, Justin J. Pearson, and Gloria Johnson to January 6 rioters. He cited them for disorderly behavior. And today, the GOP supermajority is deciding their fate. So far, one has already been expelled, and a vote to expel another failed, with Gloria Johnson surviving. The vote on the third representative is still happening tonight, and the move comes after thousands of students marched on the state capitol demanding their lawmakers pass gun reform after those three students and three staff members died in last week's mass shooting. Now, Tennessee has only expelled lawmakers a handful of times in the modern era for criminal or sexual misconduct, and that was done by a bipartisan vote. Our Alex Perez leads us off from Nashville. I hereby declare Representative Justin Jones of the 57 Representative District expelled. Tonight, in a rare move, the Tennessee State House deciding if they should expel three Democratic lawmakers who violated decorum during this moment. Tensions rising as one member was expelled, another saved, one more vote expected later tonight. The state representative's outrage is stemming from that shooting at a Nashville elementary school. Three staffers and three students killed. With protesters calling for gun reform at the state capitol last Thursday. Democrats Gloria Johnson, Justin Jones and Justin Pearson interrupting the legislative session. I have to raise the voice of the people in my district. And I did what I felt those folks wanted me to do. Speaker of the House Cameron Sexton on a radio show accusing them of trying to incite an insurrection. What they did today was equivalent, at least equivalent, maybe worse, depending on how you look at it, of doing an insurrection in the Capitol. Pearson knocking down that claim. The thousands of children and adults who marched outside of the People's House are not insurrectionists. My walk, my colleagues' walk to the House floor was in a peaceful and civil manner, and it was not an insurrection. Today, ahead of the expulsion vote, Johnson, Jones, and Pearson walking defiantly into the state capitol amid chants of, we support the Tennessee Three. And tonight, with hundreds chanting outside the chamber, Jones calling this a political lynching. This should sound the alarm across the nation that we're entering into very dangerous territory. And Alex Perez joins us now from outside the Tennessee Capitol. Alex, we know the whole nation is watching this play out. What's the White House saying tonight? 
Well, Trevor, the White House is blasting the proceedings, calling them undemocratic and without precedent. Any ousted representative will be able to once again run for their seat in a special election if they so choose. Trevor? Alex Perez in Tennessee. Alex, thank you. And for more now on the implications of this controversy, I am joined by former Congressman Chris Jacobs, a New York Republican who stood up for gun reform and then lost the support of his party and decided not to seek reelection. Congressman, thanks so much for being here. Uh, I mean, first of all, you have a very unique experience there in that you were largely attacked by members of your own party. Can you tell us what that was like for you? Uh, Ten days before the shooting in Uvalde uh, was the mass shooting here at the supermarket in, in the city of Buffalo, where I'm from. And um, that really started me on my kind of uh, situation with, with changing my position on, on assault weapons. And uh, as you mentioned, I uh, soon after the mass shooting in Buffalo, where 10 people were gunned down by someone with a semi-automatic uh, military-grade uh, rifle, uh, I, I came out saying that uh, I, if a assault weapon ban vote came to the floor, I would vote for it. I did not think that would happen, but I would do that. And also I would support uh, uh, tangential reforms to assault weapons, one of them being a magazine limit. I don't think anybody needs to have a 50 round magazine uh, and also uh, an age limit. Uh, you have to be 21 in New York state or I think every state in the nation to Drink alcohol, I think it's highly reasonable to have a 21-year-old age requirement for such a lethal weapon as a, uh, a semi-automatic. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, I quickly lost a lot of support from uh, the Republican Party uh, and uh, was threatened with, um, with primaries, both from the Republican Party and Conservative Party. And uh, although I thought I could prevail, I thought it would be a very... Uh, unproductive way of trying to be productive in terms of this discussion, in terms of common sense uh, uh, gun uh, legislation. Uh, so I decided not to run for re-election. And we do know that uh, the Texas GOP censored Representative Gonzalez. You, of course, face those repercussions as we've discussed. It, you know, occasionally members of Congress will defect from traditional party ideas. But I mean, this seems to be an issue where any kind of suggestion of reform or restriction within the Republican Party is going to come with some pretty substantial repercussions. Why is that? Uh, it seems to be the, the aid of this in, in both parties. And uh, the person from your station I was talking to, and I have talked to many moderate Democrats on this issue, they have uh, the similar situation with, uh, with abortion. Uh, if they're not all in 100% uh, abortion all the way up to conception, they are going to be ostracized. And we see that in the Congress. There's only one pro-life, one pro-life in the entire Congress, a uh, Democrat. Uh, so you will be ostracized in that party if you uh, uh, sway at all um, on that issue. Uh, this is not the way democracy, in my mind, should work, that you are ostracized if you go um, and have some independent thought on an issue. And Tony Gonzalez represents the Uvalde. Uh, it represents those families who uh, have, have suffered so. And I think that that's, uh, the Safer Communities Act, which she voted for, specifically dealt with issues pertaining to school safety, specifically dealt with issues pertaining to mental health. Uh, he was not where I was on, on the willingness to go for a assault weapons ban. Uh, I thought he, he was very moderate. He was very conscious of his... I was disappointed. I wanted him to be with me, but he wouldn't be with me because he wasn't... He felt, felt he had to be in sync to some extent with his district, which I respect, uh, and I, I'm just shocked uh, at, uh, that, uh, that this is happening. Uh, he doesn't deserve this, and it's bad for our party. I mean, given that rigidity, from, uh, as you point out, from either party, does that mean progress is impossible on these issues? Well, we got to keep trying, but uh, we are a very polarized nation, as you know right now, and uh, the Congress is representative of that. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we have things in play like social media uh, that amplify, uh, that benefit by the polarization. People get along, work together. That's really not as exciting and scintillating a story. Uh, we have to get beyond that as as uh, representatives because we should be uh, we should be able to rise above that. Former New York Congressman Chris Jacobs, thank you so much for your time.
And next, a new report by the State Department and the Pentagon is trying to give the American public a better understanding of what caused the 2021 withdrawal from Afghanistan to be so chaotic. So what exactly went wrong and could anything have been have prevented the more than 150 lives lost in the process? ABC's Mary Bruce has the details. Tonight, nearly two years after the end of the war in Afghanistan, the White House acknowledging the chaotic evacuation should have been handled differently. The world watched in August of 2021, thousands rushing to evacuate Kabul, crowding the airport, some even clinging to the side of this military jet. ISIS taking advantage of their desperation, a bomber killing over 150 civilians and 13 American service members. Still at the time, President Biden called the evacuation an extraordinary success. Now some say we should have started mass evacuation sooner. And couldn't this have been done, have been done in a more orderly manner? I respectfully disagree. The administration's new after-action report does not explicitly say that mistakes were made, but it does cite areas where policy has since changed. The report saying we now prioritize earlier evacuations when faced with a degrading security situation, and that in a destabilizing security environment, we now err on the side of aggressive communication about risks. In hindsight, in reading this, does the president have any regrets about how this withdrawal was carried out? The president's very proud of the manner in which uh, the men and women of the military, the foreign service, the intelligence community conducted this uh, withdrawal. But uh, look, I've been around operations my entire life, and there's not a single one uh, that, uh, that ever goes perfectly according to plan. The administration was stunned that the Taliban took over Afghanistan in just 11 days. But the new report indicates they think it was inevitable, that there was no scenario except a permanent and significantly expanded U.S. military presence that would have changed the trajectory. A lot of American families asking that exact question. Mary and Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. Does in this report, Mary, does President Biden and the White House, did they actually take complete responsibility for the, how this withdrawal played out? Well, the White House is actually laying a lot of responsibility on the former president, saying that their hands were tied by the deal that Trump made with the Taliban to withdraw U.S. troops by the spring of 2021. And they say that the Trump team failed to share information about any of this during the transition. But pressed repeatedly on this today, the White House, Trevor, was clear that President Biden is the commander in chief. And they say ultimately he does bear full responsibility. All right, Mary Bruce Forrest. Mary, thank you. Next tonight, the stunning new report from ProPublica that's raising questions about Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. It claims for decades, Thomas and his wife have accepted luxury vacations from a Republican mega donor without disclosing them. And now that donor is pushing back on this report. ABC's Terry Moran is in Washington. Justice Clarence Thomas has long described himself as a simple man with simple tastes. I prefer the RV parks. I prefer the Walmart parking lots to the beaches and things like that. There's something normal to me about it. I come from regular stock. But for more than 20 years, Justice Thomas has accepted lavish vacation trips from a Republican mega donor without disclosing them, according to a new report from the nonprofit journalism site ProPublica. Island hopping on a super yacht through Indonesia's lesser Sunda Islands. Retreats at the luxury Adirondack Resort Camp Topbridge. All male retreats at the exclusive Bohemian Grove in California. Trips that would cost a small fortune. Thomas and his wife Jenny have enjoyed them. And flights on a Bombardier Global private jet as well. All without paying ProPublica reports. In a statement, Harlan Crow, the Dallas real estate billionaire who picks up the tabs for these trips, says he and Thomas have been friends since 1996. The hospitality we've extended to the Thomases over the years is no different from the hospitality we've extended to our many other dear friends. Crow adds that he and Justice Thomas have never discussed any pending or lower court case. As a Supreme Court justice, Thomas is not bound by any formal ethics code, though he does file annual financial disclosure forms which have not included the trips with Crow, according to ProPublica. And today, many Democrats called for action. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Dick Durbin tweeting that Thomas's trips undermine the trust that our country places in the Supreme Court. And let's get right to Terry Moran on this. Terry, with all those calls for action, we know this is eye-opening reporting, but where did this actually go next? 
Well, that's a question, Trevor. There has been talk in the past of a formal ethics code for Supreme Court justices, just like all other federal judges have to abide by. But the Supreme Court doesn't. The Congress does have authority to legislate uh, practices for the Supreme Court. They're careful to do that because of separation of powers. But a report like this uh, is going to spur a lot of discussion on Capitol Hill. And at least one representative, Representative Alexandria Alcosia-Cortez, She's calling for uh, Justice Thomas's impeachment. That would be interesting to see. It's uh, certainly substantial allegations. Terry Moran, thank you. And the Supreme Court was in action today, denying West Virginia's request to reinstate a state law banning transgender women and girls from participating in public school sports teams consistent with their gender identity. The decision is a win for a 12-year-old transgender girl and her parents. And this ruling is also seen as a victory for transgender rights advocates as states across the country have been enacting similar bans. This decision comes as the Education Department has also announced they're carving out exceptions for fairness in competition or the possibility that participation could lead to sports-related injury when it comes to transgender athletes. Overseas tonight, clouds of tear gas lit up the Paris sky once again as police fired against unruly protesters. Hundreds of thousands of demonstrators returned to the streets across the country to vent their anger against President Emmanuel Macron's contested pension reforms. The talks between trade union leaders and Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne quickly collapsed Wednesday without a breakthrough. Meanwhile, President Macron was in Beijing, urging Chinese President Xi Jinping to use his influence with Russia to help bring an end to the war in Ukraine. And in the Middle East, a new round of violent clashes, Palestinian worshipers barricading them side barricading themselves inside Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is one of Islam's holiest sites, as Israeli police forcibly removed them. And now rockets have been fired on Israel from inside Lebanon. That's raising fears that the violence will spread. ABC's Matt Gutman is in Israel for us. Tonight, Israeli airstrikes lighting up parts of the Gaza Strip after Palestinian militant groups fired a barrage of rockets into Israel from Lebanon this afternoon. Dozens of rockets streaked across the sky into Israel's north, sirens wailing. Regional tensions at a boiling point since Israeli forces stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque multiple nights this week during Ramadan. This is the largest bombardment Israel has faced from Lebanon since 2006. Israeli military is saying its Iron Dome defense system intercepted 25 rockets, but that at least five landed inside Israel. A thick column of smoke rising after one rocket slammed into a bank. At least two people injured. And this week, night after night, those clashes at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, one of Islam's holiest sites. On Wednesday, Palestinian worshippers attempting to barricade themselves inside the mosque, pelting police with rocks and chairs. And earlier this week, when Israeli police stormed the mosque, they were blasted with fireworks and beating barricaded demonstrators with their weapons. The video sending shockwaves throughout the Muslim world. Matt Gutman reporting that tonight. Matt, thank you. We have still much more to get here on Prime. Coming up, body camera video shows the tense moments as police officers rush to rescue a family of six trapped on the second floor of a burning home. But next in our Prime Focus, a complicated question. What is masculinity? Quest, some go on to define it that can lead to dangerous consequences and to be a telltale sign they're suffering from a fairly new mental health condition, so-called bigorexia. What do they see? They often say they look ugly. They look like a monster. They look hideous. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. With a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. 
my favorite show. For over 20 years, we've given some real-life superhero moms the mother of all surprises. Oh, my goodness! It's GMA's Breakfast in Bed. This is amazing. I had no idea. And now, this year, we want to give our biggest, most epic live Mother's Day surprise yet to the most deserving mom. Oh, my goodness. So go now to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter to share your mom's story and honor her the GMA way. Whenever news breaks. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. From the scene of that deadly missile strike. ABC News Live everywhere. Reporting from Jerusalem, from Uvalde, Texas. On the 2024 campaign trail. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. Well, some billboards, storefronts, TV commercials, even toys send a clear message to men and boys that the bigger the muscles, the better the man. Experts say those images could be partially to blame for a fairly new form of body dysmorphic disorder that leads to overly rigorous workouts, dangerous dieting, and even cosmetic procedures. From a student to a fitness expert and even a Hollywood leading man, it can impact anyone. We take a look at the devastating consequences of society's shifting view of masculinity. So every day I have to wake up and I have to show the world that I'm a man. It's not enough that I am a man. I have to now prove my worth. You're never gonna look as good as you do in the gym. It was the same, almost the same feeling of this has to happen now or something terrible, something really bad's gonna happen to me the same way your body is maybe telling you you're gonna die if you don't take that breath. You've heard the term gym rat. You've seen fitness models all over social media touting how they achieve their enviable figures. Maybe you even have a friend who seems to spend all their time at the gym pushing themselves to the limits. No pain, no gain. Can there be too much of a good thing? When does working out become an addiction? Justin Baldoni is known for playing handsome, muscular characters like Rafael Solano in Jane the Virgin. Why were you trying to get in the shower with me? Like so many, his own masculinity became tied to how he looked. I ran track, I played soccer, and I tore my hamstring my senior year. And I lost everything. And I got depressed. So I overcompensated, like we all do, and I went in the gym and I tried to get as buff and strong and big as I could. And from that point on, the way that I, I felt in clothes, the way that other boys and other men looked at me, the way that other girls looked at me, I was like, oh, okay. So in order to get respect, in order to have the girls be attracted to me, in order to feel like I'm enough, I need to be big. You can use my shirt. And that began a whole journey in my 20s where I was just the dude that always would take off his shirt, that always had the six pack, that was just always in shape. Noah Neiman, the co-founder of Rumble Boxing, remembers 10 years ago showing us on ABC how to get the perfect V cut. Make sure you're using your abs. I want you to lean it back. It's this little ligament right there. Okay, so, here. Yeah. But even as the literal model of fitness, he too was his own harshest critic. I'm on national TV talking about, you know, looking good and feeling good in your abs, and I was self-conscious. And I'm a professional, and I was at home being like, oh, I should have done I some more sit-ups. I felt that I didn't look good. And aspirations of the ideal male physique don't just impact Hollywood actors and fitness professionals. My friend had like a gym in his shed in the back of his house, in like his garage. Um, and I went there and started lifting weights. And I was hearing words of dedication and consistency and, and working hard and all, the, all these things that felt good, felt like I was getting that kind of respect. And a lot of this revolved around masculinity for me as well and the idea of being manly. Muscle dysmorphia, sometimes known as bigorexia, is a type of body dysmorphic disorder where someone perceives their body shape as a distressing flaw in their appearance that doesn't line up with how they might actually look. It affects mostly men uh, and boys who think their body build is too small and puny, that they're not big and muscular enough. 
um, when in reality they look entirely normal or some of them are very muscular, but they don't see themselves that way. The more you focus in on it, the more you can find flaws? Yes, and the more distorted your perception gets. Perhaps it's a little bit like staring at a word on a page that you're reading. After a while, it starts looking a little distorted and odd, right? Uh, Dr. Katherine Phillips, along with her fellow authors, coined the term muscle dysmorphia more than 20 years ago in their book, The Adonis Complex. Take us back to the early 90s. I mean, how was body dysmorphia, or more specifically, muscle dysmorphia considered in society? Was it even considered at all? No, no. Uh, scientists weren't aware of it. Doctors weren't aware of it. If you think of Cary Grant and, you know, the era of my father, your grandfather, <laughs> they weren't obsessed with being muscular. They were perfectly happy with a sort of ordinary body build. And then over the decades, especially I'd say from the 1990s onward, we see an increasing emphasis on a more muscular male body in advertising in action figures, the toys that boys play with. It's a secret crisis Dr. Phillips estimates 2 to 3% of the general population suffer from, largely in silence. I remember one of the first patients I saw with muscle dysmorphia. I noticed that he had six layers of t-shirts he was trying to look bigger. And that idea of looking bigger has become an increasing expectation for men around the world. 26-year-old PhD student George Mycock from England says his journey with muscle dysmorphia started when he was just 13. When he originally began playing rugby to be tough like his dad. People started to kind of call me big man or like people started to kind of award these violent behaviors that I would do on the pitch and people would associate me with being tough and being strong and being powerful. It became a part of his identity, an identity that was taken away when he broke his back and told he should never play rugby again. I was emotional eating because I was just upset about not being able to play rugby anymore um, and losing this part of my identity. So I gained a significant amount of weight. That's when George began to hit the gym arguably too often, but online forums told him otherwise. You know, the, the term freak is a term of endearment in the fitness community. If you want to become really muscular, you want to be you know, successful and push and pushing through this barrier, pe friends are going to not understand, your family is not going to understand, but it's your responsibility to ignore that and push through. After nearly 10 years of tough workouts and strict diets, he was still not satisfied with how he looked. I basically got to the point where I felt like I would never be what I wanted to be, and I felt like it would be better if I wasn't here. And one of my friends noticed that I'd been away for a long time, and I was literally on that day, I was planning how I was gonna do it. For trainer Noah, and a lot of men worldwide, his story parallels George's. I was really self-conscious, so I would avoid playing basketball because God forbid I was picked on the skins team. You're literally looking at the mirror, and I've done it before. You know, I've had, I've, I've, I've gone as extreme as, you know, eating the Rice Krispie treat and being like, damn, that's 100 calories, I gotta get on the bike. You think that negative thinking would have killed you? Yes, I mean, I was over-exercising, I was underfeeding myself, and that just wreaked havoc on my sleep, on, you know, my ability to function as a human, and those things took me into a very depressive state. Mm -hmm. So you try to crawl out of it, and I tried to crawl out of it through drugs. Noah realized he needed to change his mindset, chasing a feeling, not a finish line. I don't want to train for a six pack. Whoa. I want to train because it makes me feel like the strongest version of myself and like I'm progressing today. Like I'm getting a little bit better today. And that progression is got to be, it's got to be the foundation of happiness. Hey, Justin, all the way left. And Justin, too, realized he needed to change his motivations for working out, taking a break from acting, now preaching what he calls the why ladder, detailed in his books Man Enough and Boys Will Be Human. Why do you want to work out? Okay, why? And then why? Generally, that third why gets you to the core root of the reason. It doesn't matter what the reason is. So long as you are aware of the reason, then go in the gym. How about a toast? He regularly discusses the pressures of what it means to be a man on his Man Enough podcast. Raise your hand if you've ever had body image issues. 
and he encourages his son to understand there's more than just working out the body. I always tell him the heart is the strongest muscle in the body. Of course, scientifically, we know it's the tongue or the brain, but metaphorically, it really is. And with George's darkest days behind him, he's now studying for his doctorate in muscularity-oriented issues, starting his own podcast and website called Myo Minds, initially a sounding board for others to talk about their own experience with fitness. I was overwhelmed by how many that it was that, that shared something and, and said, resonated with what I'd said and the fact that none of them had ever told me that before. And all three men say, while there is no question fitness is important, for them, it comes down to self-worth. And in some cases, pairing that with professional help. What do you think teenage Noah, who oh. felt bad watching MTV, <laughs> would have thought with the TikTok reels and Instagram seeing what it is now? Oh, it would have destroyed me. Absolutely, I'm, and I'm just being honest. It almost destroyed me when I was a kid. And it, 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 you know, it breaks my heart to know that there are kids growing up that see only the highlight reels that see only the, you know, manufactured, polished, Hollywood, uh, uh, you know, idyllic bodies. And it's just not realistic. When you get to the top of the mountain or f maybe further up the mountain, the grass isn't greener. Your insecurities don't go away because what you're trying to fill is a void that no amount of muscle will ever fix. Incredibly powerful hearing these men's stories, and we still have much more to get to coming up. The legal battle over a burrito bowl. The new developments from a lawsuit between Chipotle and Sweetgreen. But next, it's a highly watched golf tournament with a rich tradition as it tees off today. We take a look at the Masters by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Elephants are more like us than we ever thought possible. They speak to each other in ways we're just beginning to understand. It's not just noise. with us if we only listen. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Brooke Shields, the most photographed woman in the world. A sexualized child model. Exploitation. What happened to her isn't really about hers. It's just about women. I let myself be vulnerable. And this is the first time I've ever spoken about what happened. I thought my one no should have been enough. You know. When someone like Brooke Shields talks about it, it makes a difference. I'm amazed that I survived any of it. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on. Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Name, image, and likeness, or NIL. The three magic words that have upended the landscape of college sports as we've known it. It's just the ability to make money through social media marketing. It changed everything. My concern is how is it handled? Critics will say people like yourself are buying these athletes. I mean, what do you say to that? Cashing in the debate over paying college athletes. Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. 
This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. It's a tradition unlike any other, and it teed off today. Here is the Masters by the Numbers. The 87th Masters Tournament opened this morning in Augusta, Georgia. It's the first major of the golf season. It was in 1949 when legend Sam Snead became the first champ to receive one of those famous green jackets tailored just for the winner. And when it comes to winning, nobody's done it more than Jack Nicklaus. The Golden Bear won six times over three decades between 1963 and 1986. This year, the number one player in the world, Scotty Scheffler, is looking to repeat. That feat has not been accomplished since Tiger Woods went back to back with his 2002 victory. And Tiger Woods also has the distinction as the youngest winner ever, just 21, when he won his first green jacket back in 1997. Speaking of Tiger, this year is his 25th Masters. He is downplaying expectations, but he of course remains the single biggest draw at Augusta National. And that course, by the way, is 7,545 yards across its 18 holes, including the three-hole stretch known as Amen Corner. Now, between today and Sunday, about 40,000 patrons are going to line the fairways to watch as guests at this exclusive club. So exclusive, in fact, that previously and quite controversially, it wasn't until 2012 when the first female members were admitted, including former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. But one thing everybody can agree on is the food. A pimento cheese sandwich there will cost you a buck fifty on the famously frugal concession menu, and you can wash it down with a cold beer for just five bucks this year. We have much more ahead here on Prime. We're going to tell you what we're learning about a new COVID variant that health officials are paying very close attention to overseas. Plus, nearly 2 billion Muslims are observing Ramadan. We get a close and personal look at what it means to the faith and how one woman is balancing it with her daily life. And he's a YouTube star turned television sensation. Rapper Lil Dicky tells us how he balances comedy with depth and introspection in the new season of his hit show, Dave. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The news-making interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. It's so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. A superhero of the Avengers, who risked his own life to try to save his nephew. Someone's been run over by a snowcat. Hurry, he's been crushed. There's a lot of blood over here. Oh. Seven tons of machinery bearing down. Jeremy Renner. I heard that in sign language you said to your family, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you remember the pain? Oh, all of it. The Diane Sawyer interview, tonight at 10, 9 central on ABC. Name, image, and likeness, or NIL. The three magic words that have upended the landscape of college sports as we've known it. It's just the ability to make money through social media marketing. It changed everything. My concern is, how is it handled? 
critics will say people like yourself are buying these athletes. I mean, what do you say to that? Cashing in the debate over paying college athletes. Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. 13 women opened their doors to the man who would end their lives. Truth and Lies, The Boston Strangler, the new true crime podcast series. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts and watch Boston Strangler starring Kira Knightley, streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Body camera video shows the dramatic rescue of a family trapped in a burning home. Health officials are monitoring another new COVID variant. And a major singer calls out a magazine for how it edited her photos. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. We're coming, we're coming. In a video released by Frankfort Police Department, multiple officers are seen rescuing a family of six from a fire, including a baby. Authorities say three officers were first to arrive at the scene. Occupants yelled down to officers through a window on the second floor, saying they're trapped due to the flames and smoke. They also told police there was a baby inside. The officer scaled a ladder to the second story window to rescue the baby first, then the rest of the occupants. All three officers received a Medal of Valor for their service. Well, there's a new COVID-19 sub-variant that health officials say is spreading quickly in other parts of the world. It's an Omicron sub-variant labeled XBB-116. This new sub-variant does appear to be more transmissible, but there's no evidence it's any more dangerous, and so far it is not present in the U.S. at any meaningful level. It has not been reported by the CDC variant estimates, at least not yet. Methane levels in the atmosphere continue to rise in 2022, part of a historic increase in planet warming greenhouse gases. Climate scientists are especially concerned about methane because it traps much more heat than carbon dioxide. Methane is emitted from oil and natural gas systems, landfills and livestock. And the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says levels of methane show no signs of slowing. It's a battle of the bulls. Chipotle Mexican Grill filing a lawsuit in California against salad chain Sweetgreen, alleging Sweetgreen's new Chipotle chicken burrito bowl violates Chipotle's trademark rights. Sweetgreen describing the item as the latest iteration of its menu, but response has been spicy, with Sweetgreen's stock price falling more than 11% on Wednesday. Chipotle is requesting a court order to block Sweetgreen's use of the Chipotle name in addition to unspecified damages. Two former Donda Academy teachers are suing the Kanye West-founded school for racial discrimination and wrongful termination. The lawsuit also alleges the school violates numerous health and safety code regulations, including only serving students one meal a day of sushi, and that there were no proper disciplinary procedures and a lack of security. The teachers claim they were fired in retaliation for reporting the violations. ABC News has reached out to Donda Academy. It's unclear whether West, who now goes by Ye, currently has representation. Singer Carol G is calling out GQ Mexico for allegedly photoshopping her face and body during her latest cover appearance. The Mañana Será Bonito singer posted the altered photo on her social media saying, Today, my cover with GQ was published with an image that does not represent me. Carol G called the alterations disrespectful to both her and women who wake up wanting to feel comfortable with themselves despite society stereotypes. And in a few minutes, we're going to hear from Jeremy Renner on his hard-fought recovery. And we'll also catch up with Dave Bird, also known as rapper Lil Dicky, to talk about the new season of his hit show, Dave. But first, we're getting a personal look at Ramadan. Nearly 2 billion Muslims around the world are observing it. They're fasting from dawn until sunset. 
But this month is about a lot more than just shifting mealtimes. And resident physician Hanya Kalan has been using her social media platform to showcase her religious practices and how she balances it all with her daily life. She spent a week chronicling her experiences during Ramadan for us and gives us this glimpse at the life of a fasting Muslim. I look at this month as a chance for me to not only spiritually elevate myself, but also be a better person in all aspects of my life. My name is Hanya and I'm a third year resident physician. I work anywhere from 10 to 12 hours a day, so fasting can be difficult, but it's important to make time to do the things that are important to us. And to me, fasting is a part of one of my favorite months of the year. Ramzan is not just about fasting and being hungry, it's about refraining from things that are negative and also we try to make this time a time of reflection. In the morning, we have sehri, which is the breakfast of eating before a sun rise. And uh, when we break our fast, it's called iftar. You'll see me talking about the different prayers. We have Fajr, Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. And those are the five prayers that Muslims pray. Pray for the whole Lord. Yes. For the peace in the whole world. Yes. Prayer and forms of worship comes in different ways. And, you know, fasting is obligatory for Muslims being a, a resident doctor in training because there is so much of what I do that I feels like prayer. You know, I think that going into a room and helping patients and helping heal people feels like a form of worship. This is Minnie just following me around everywhere I go, but usually after we break our fast, we um, pray the Maghrib prayers, which are the evening prayers. And then after prayer is when we have our full dinner. Being able to cook and have time to cook iftar as a resident is not something I could have thought about as an intern. But overall, we average in most specialties, especially as interns, 80 hours a week. Hey guys, the sun is officially up, so no more eating. Eating stopped a while ago. Uh, we ate, prayed, and it's officially the start, the starting hours of the fast. So I have come to this coffee shop to hopefully be productive for about an hour or so. I love this coffee shop, I don't get to at least smell the beans even if I can't have the coffee. It's time to break fast. I think it just gets better as you fast more, your body gets used to it. I think that's the beauty in it. But you still appreciate that food so much. We've stopped eating now. Uh, I'm looking for the sun somewhere in this beautiful sky, but cannot see it. Now it is about 3 p.m. I am gonna go pray and study for a couple hours and then head over to go home to break my fast. I do have clinic until 8 p.m. So more than likely I'll be breaking my fast at clinic. I have to find time to pray, whether it's my car or a corner in, you know, where I'm working at, I kind of just make it work. Um, but I have my scarf on, so I'm gonna switch into my scarf cap for work. So I finally got home, got to pray um, my prayers for tonight, and I am done with Isha and Tharabi prayers. I will wrap up the night with listening to some Quran um, as I just fall asleep. It is 5 a.m. and we are all awake. Most of us are awake today for Saturday. Now, um, I'm missing one person, my brother. Good morning, Assalamualaikum. Hey, wake up, time for Saturday. We have a amazing Pakistani dish right here. Uh, some omelets, Pakistani style, the way my mom makes them. Some roti and some yogurt. Really excited to eat this. We've all eaten and done the call to prayer. So now we're having congregational prayers together as a family. Hello from Night Clinic. Um, it is currently almost 6 p.m., uh, about an hour and a half, an hour and 40 minutes until I get to break my fast. I use my social platforms now to help encourage other first-gen, low-income pre-meds. Um, and I try to make sure that I 
remind them, you know, to stay grounded in this journey because it's very hard and it's really easy to get jaded and it's really easy to feel like, you know, maybe it's not for you, but I do feel like <laughs> I'm just like crying now. Whoops. I feel like faith was a really big part of why I was able to push through. And I think that there's a beauty in exemplifying your relation with God in a way that can transcend religions. And our thanks to Hanya Kalan for providing us that glimpse into her life. Next to an ABC News exclusive, our Diane Sawyer sat down one-on-one -on -one with actor Jeremy Renner after his life-threatening accident to discuss his grueling physical therapy and what it means to have a real superpower. We arrive at Jeremy Renner's house in Los Angeles, and we expect a quiet sanctuary, a shattered man recovering from a brutal accident. But what's that? Any way you want. Music is blasting, a horde of people everywhere, and the patient is dancing. It's journeys any way you want it. Feels good. What's good? Where am I? Easing up on it. Look at you! Look at you! Oh, it is so great to see you in every way. Oh, I don't want to touch anything that hurts. Oh, everything's good. Oh. Impossible that it's only been 10 weeks since this. Do you remember the pain? Oh, all of it. Well, they sort of moved my legs, and I said, oh, that one, that one's really messed up. But I said, oh, yeah, that leg's going to, that's going to be a problem. And they're like, what's my body look like? Am I just going to be like a spine and a, and a brain, like a science experiment? Is that my existence now? What, what am I, what's my existence going to be like? Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Every single day for hours, he deploys his ferocious willpower to push through the pain, knowing how lucky he is to have the privilege of his health care and his family cheering him on. Yeah, it's nice to see my sister light up when I can just stand up on the, on the walker, you know. His physical therapist is Dr. Christopher Vincent. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is a lot of scar tissue built up in here. It's all mental. It's a mental game. Yeah, it hurts like hell. You're so motivated yeah. to, to heal, yeah, yeah. to get back to your life. Well, what's the alternative, you know what I mean? He wants everyone to know that the real superpower is the ability to transform your suffering into your strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bubba. This is what I talk to my family about from all their perspectives, which are horrifying, that I put upon them. What we just endured, that's real love. It's suffering, but that feeds the seeds of what love is. And Jeremy Renner, the Diane Sawyer interview airs tonight, 10 o'clock Eastern on ABC. It will stream tomorrow on Hulu. It's one of the most watched series in FX Network's history. The award-winning series, Dave, returning now once again to Bear All. Let's take a look. Oh, young Dave, one of them, like, hell him. He had a name tag that said, I might be pronouncing He slash him, his pronouns, Andrew's pronouns. Oh, Andrew's in hair and makeup. Okay, well, he responds to hell him, FYI. <laughs> A little dicky. Trying to bring back the old school flow, like, my name's Dave, and I'm here to say. Well, I'm joking! Oh, pull the beat up. No. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry. All right, joining us now is Dave Bird, a.k.a. Lil Dicky. Dave, great to talk to you again. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So we got season three coming up after two wildly successful season twos. I know that I spoke to you during season two, and the theme for the show leading up to now, a lot of it was based on ambition. And now, mm -hmm. like real life, it seems like season three, a lot of the theme, I guess to quote a, a different rapper, is suffering from success. Is that accurate? Uh, to an extent, yeah, sure. You know, it's a tour. It's like very much like, uh, you know, you, season two, I spent a whole season making an album, trying to get out of writer's block and figuring out how to make a body of work that I was proud of. And then like, you know, you go on tour and you literally face the music and you have to deal with the reality of what life is as a touring famous artist and tons of good. Like it's some of the most fun times of my life, but also there are there are wacky, bizarre uh, experiences that occur as well, but it's all fun, I'll tell you that. I, I, I believe I've seen that people worked on your show saying that this is the funniest season also, and this is a show that people already said was extremely funny. 
Uh, I'm curious, your show gets amazing ratings. It's also critically reviewed really well. I'm sure that also brings a weight to writing another season, right? Yeah, I mean, I I'm very proud of uh, the the show that we've made the first two seasons, but like I'm I'm uh, constantly trying to figure out how to like uh, outdo my own personal level of satisfaction, and I try to really like best of both seasons kind of like create this hybrid that the season three that I think has like whatever you liked about season one, whatever you liked about season two, it's like all those things combined for like what I think is the best season yet for sure. Oh my god, it's you. Oh, that's me. Yeah. Oh, wow, it's so heavy. It's concrete, that's why. It's like sharp, too. I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> I appreciate this so much, okay? What I'm curious about is when you're having all this success in your real life, but then you use so much of it as fodder for the TV show, how do you stay present with your real life and not be constantly thinking, well, is this good material for a TV show? The challenge of my life, you hit it head on. You know, I think that I need to constantly, it's interesting because like living life, uh, some of the best experience I have in life, I'm sitting there and I think, you know, wow, this is a great experience. And then immediately my brain just goes, so how can this fit into the show? And I think that's, uh, on the one hand, it's providing my TV show with endless amounts of content. On the other hand, I think deep down, I know that's the wrong way to live your life. You're notorious for being, you're, you are Mr. Celebrity Cameo. You can pull basically whoever you'd like. Who can we see in season three of Dave? Oh man, I mean, first off, there are names that I can't even name because it will really make your brain combust and you'll have to just watch to see it. Later in the season, some of the celebrities we've got, it's like, I don't even know where we could go from there. But you know, a few things early on, we got guys like Rick Ross, Usher. Usher was the first concert I ever went to as, as a young boy. So for him to come on my set and be in my TV show, a total dream come true, full circle moment. Dave, I know that over the seasons, we of course do see that increase of vulnerability in your character, a lot of individual progress. And the second season does end with kind of a breakthrough moment. And then in these first couple episodes of the new season, we see how that's affected him. Can you give us without spoilers an idea of what growth we might see from Dave this season? I think the main growth, like, you know, this season is about kind of two things in one. One, like, you know, the endless pursuit of fame and validation that I think, you know, it can be reflected in celebrity culture with like a guy like me who wants to be like the best, most well-received artist he could possibly be, but also just society in general. I think we live in a time where like everyone kind of wants to be their own celebrity, so to speak, with social media and TikTok. And it's like a lot of people kind of have main character syndrome, but then also romance, love, looking for love. Like there's a whole arc this season about me being a hopeless romantic, just like trying to find my wife. And I think my character uh, goes through just a surprising journey. And I think we make a lot of like really interesting commentary on like the modern landscape of dating and like gender norms. And you'll have to watch it to see. We certainly will. You can catch Dave Wednesdays on FXX and stream all episodes on Hulu. Dave Bird, AKA Lil Dicky. Thanks a lot. Dave. Thank you for having me. Guys, watch this season. It's phenomenal, I swear. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Trevor Alt. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, the new details in the urgent search for a killer who brutally stabbed the founder of Cash App. Plus, what to expect is the weather system that spawned at least six tornadoes in the last 24 hours now hits the East Coast. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Elephants are...
are more like us than we ever thought possible. They speak to each other in ways we're just beginning to understand. It's not just noise. It's an ancient wisdom formed over generations. They'll share their secrets with us. If we only listen. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Name, image, and likeness, or NIL. The three magic words that have upended the landscape of college sports as we've known it. It's just the ability to make money through social media marketing. It changed everything. My concern is, how is it handled? Critics will say, people like yourself are buying these athletes. I mean, what do you say to that? Cashing in the debate over paying college athletes. Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Trevor Alt. Thanks for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The Supreme Court today denied West Virginia's request to reinstate a state law banning transgender women and girls from participating on public school sports teams consistent with their gender identity. The ruling is also seen as a victory for transgender rights advocates. As states across the country are enacting similar bans. This decision comes as the Education Department has also announced they're carving out exceptions for fairness in competition or the possibility that participation could lead to sports related injury. A doctor in Southern California has been indicted on charges of trying to poison her husband by allegedly pouring Drano into his drinks. Prosecutors say she repeatedly put Drano in his tea and her husband said he set up a hidden camera after noticing a chemical taste. He has since filed for divorce. The lawyer for the doctor says she will plead not guilty at her arraignment. And a massive avalanche at a ski resort in Utah. The mountain of snow crossing a highway and onto the Snowbird Resort. Ski patrol and rescue dogs search for possible victims. They thankfully gave the all clear. Well, next to the tensions boiling over for lawmakers in Tennessee after that mass shooting at the Covenant School in Nashville, the state legislature has been debating all day whether or not to expel three Democratic lawmakers after they protested for gun control on the floor of the chamber. Two of those Democratic lawmakers, both African Americans, were ultimately ousted, and one of those lawmakers likened today's vote to a political lynching. So what is the latest on their status? Alex Perez reports from Nashville. I hereby declare Representative Justin Jones of the 57th Representative District expelled. Tonight, in a rare move, the Tennessee State House deciding if they should expel three Democratic lawmakers who violated decorum during this moment. Tensions rising as one member was expelled, another saved, one more vote expected later tonight. The state representative's outrage is stemming from that shooting at a Nashville elementary school. Three staffers and three students killed. With protesters calling for gun reform at the state capitol last Thursday. Democrats Gloria Johnson, Justin Jones and Justin Pearson interrupting the legislative session. I have to raise the voice of the people in my district. And I did what I felt those folks wanted me to do. Speaker of the House Cameron Sexton on a radio show accusing them of trying to incite an insurrection. What they did today was equivalent, at least equivalent, maybe worse, depending on how you look at it, of doing an insurrection in the Capitol. Pearson knocking down that claim. 
the thousands of children and adults who marched outside of the People's House are not insurrectionists. My walk, my colleagues' walk to the House floor was in a peaceful and civil manner, and it was not an insurrection. Today, ahead of the expulsion vote, Johnson, Jones, and Pearson walking defiantly into the state capitol amid chants of, we support the Tennessee Three. And tonight, with hundreds chanting outside the chamber, Jones calling this a political lynching. This should sound the alarm across the nation that we're entering into very dangerous territory. That's Alex Perez reporting. Next, a new report by the State Department and the Pentagon is trying to give the American public a better understanding of what caused the withdrawal from Afghanistan to be so chaotic back in 2021. So what exactly went wrong and how could anything have prevented more than 150 lives lost in the process? ABC's Mary Bruce has the details. Tonight, nearly two years after the end of the war in Afghanistan, the White House acknowledging the chaotic evacuation should have been handled differently. The world watched in August of 2021, thousands rushing to evacuate Kabul, crowding the airport, some even clinging to the side of this military jet. ISIS taking advantage of their desperation, a bomber killing over 150 civilians and 13 American service members. Still at the time, President Biden called the evacuation an extraordinary success. Now some say we should have started mass evacuation sooner. And couldn't this have been done, have been done in a more orderly manner? I respectfully disagree. The administration's new after-action report does not explicitly say that mistakes were made, but it does cite areas where policy has since changed. The report saying we now prioritize earlier evacuations when faced with a degrading security situation, and that in a destabilizing security environment, we now err on the side of aggressive communication about risks. In hindsight, in reading this, does the president have any regrets about how this withdrawal was carried out? The president's very proud of the manner in which uh, the men and women of the military, the foreign service, the intelligence community conducted this uh, withdrawal. But uh, look, I've been around operations my entire life, and there's not a single one uh, that, uh, that ever goes perfectly according to plan. The administration was stunned that the Taliban took over Afghanistan in just 11 days. But the new report indicates they think it was inevitable, that there was no scenario except a permanent and significantly expanded U.S. military presence that would have changed the trajectory. That's Mary Bruce reporting. Next tonight, the stunning new report from ProPublica that's raising questions about Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. It claims Thomas and his wife have accepted luxury vacations from a Republican mega donor for decades without disclosing them. Now that donor is pushing back on this report. ABC's Terry Moran is in Washington. Justice Clarence Thomas has long described himself as a simple man with simple tastes. I prefer the RV parks. I prefer the Walmart parking lots to the beaches and things like that. There's something normal to me about it. I've come from regular stock. But for more than 20 years, Justice Thomas has accepted lavish vacation trips from a Republican mega donor without disclosing them, according to a new report from the nonprofit journalism site ProPublica. Island hopping on a super yacht through Indonesia's lesser Sunda Islands. Retreats at the luxury Adirondack Resort Camp Topbridge. All-male retreats at the exclusive Bohemian Grove in California. Trips that would cost a small fortune. Thomas and his wife Jenny have enjoyed them. And flights on a private Bombardier Global Private Jet as well. All without paying, ProPublica reports. In a statement, Harlan Crow, the Dallas real estate billionaire who picks up the tabs for these trips, says he and Thomas have been friends since 1996. The hospitality we've extended to the Thomases over the years is no different from the hospitality we've extended to our many other dear friends. Crow adds that he and Justice Thomas have never discussed any pending or lower court case. As a Supreme Court justice, Thomas is not bound by any formal ethics code, though he does file annual financial disclosure forms which have not included the trips with Crow, according to ProPublica. And today, many Democrats called for action. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Dick Durbin tweeting that Thomas's trips undermine the trust that our country places in the Supreme Court. 
Here in Moran Forest, Terry, thank you. Next, new details from the investigation into the fatal San Francisco stabbing of tech executive Bob Lee. Tonight, we've learned it was Lee himself who called 911 pleading for help, but that help did not arrive in time. ABC's DeMarco Morgan is in California. Tonight, the haunting images appearing to show the final desperate moment of tech executive Bob Lee's life. The Daily Mail obtaining security footage showing Lee looking for help after he was stabbed in San Francisco before he collapsed outside an apartment building. Police are now searching for a suspect. SFPD has been working around the clock to try to solve this case. Crimes like this can be very difficult to solve and it takes time. The 43 year old father of two and founder of Cash App was found unconscious just blocks away from the city's iconic Bay Bridge in an upscale neighborhood around 2 30 Tuesday morning. And now we are learning it was Lee who called 911 reportedly pleading help screaming into his phone. Someone stabbed me. His death has reignited fierce debate over public safety in the city. Elon Musk tweeting violent crime in San Francisco is horrific, and even if attackers are caught, they are often released immediately. But police statistics show last year the number of homicides in San Francisco was lower than in 44 other cities. Still, homicides and robberies have ticked up compared to this time last year. To Marco Morgan, thank you. And next tonight to that powerful storm system slamming the East Coast from D.C. to Philly to New York City. This is the same system that spawned at least six confirmed tornadoes in the last 24 hours. So senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all. Hey, Rob. Hey, Trevor, this is the last day of the severe weather threat. Boy, are we getting it across parts of the Mid-Atlantic, including Washington, D.C. Severe thunderstorm warnings uh, happening there the past hour or so, and the watch is up from southern New Jersey all the way back through uh, parts of North Carolina, and some of these that are, that are warned have 60, 70 mile per hour winds and big time hail, so likely see some power outages with this. This pushes off to the east slowly tonight. That watch in effect till 10 o'clock, but shortly after that, another round will kind of come through the New York City area and be clear sometime after midnight but the southern flank of this system is going to stall, drape itself across the southeast, and that will create the possibility for more rounds of heavy rain and some thunderstorms from the Carolinas back through Georgia, including Augusta, and into Louisiana, where two to four inches of rainfall is possible uh, through Saturday, and that's where we'll see the likelihood of seeing some flooding. So we're not quite done with this very destructive system yet. Trevor? All right, Rob Marciano for us. Rob, thank you. And we have still much more to get to coming up. Drew Apualu has gained millions of fans for mixing humor and criticism to challenge men on social media. She tells us why she has no interest in holding back. A lot of times uh, women, especially women and femmes in general, are conditioned to take the high road, right? To ignore it, yeah. to, to forget about it, to leave it alone. Not me. But next, hundreds of thousands of protesters returning to the streets of Paris, clashing with police. The talks that sparked this latest round of demonstrations. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I hug you. 
Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the nation's capital, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Clouds of tear gas lit up the Paris sky once again as police fired against unruly protesters. These demonstrators, numbering in the hundreds of thousands, returned to streets across the country to vent their anger against President Emmanuel Macron's contested pension reforms. Meanwhile, President Macron was in Beijing, urging Chinese President Xi Jinping to use his influence with Russia to help bring an end to the war in Ukraine. Also in Israel, tensions are running high after dozens of rockets streaked into the country from Lebanon. This is the heaviest bombardment Israel has faced since 2006, and all of it comes after Israeli police stormed Al-Aqsa Mosque, one of Islam's holiest sites, multiple nights this week during the Holy Week of Ramadan. Israeli military officials say their Iron Dorms Dome system shot down 25 rockets that at least five landed in Israel, injuring at least two. Moments ago, Israeli fighter jets bombing tunnels and weapons manufacturing sites belonging to Hamas in the Gaza Strip. And for all of you soccer fans out there, FIFA has announced its global rankings, placing World Cup champions Argentina at the top of the list. Argentina, of course, beating France in a dramatic shootout at last year's World Cup in Qatar. Three-time champs led by Lionel Messi overtaking Brazil after a six-year gap. Well, now to our weekly segment, Tick Talk, where we interview some of our favorite Tick Talkers. Taking a closer look at the story behind this sensation, our next guest is shaking up the comment section. She's known to her nearly 8 million followers as a defender of women, Drew Afualo. She's calling out bullies on the internet one comment at a time. And Arcana Whitworth sat down with Drew to learn more about her online impact in this week's TikTok. Hey! Busy couple weeks, am I right? <laughs> Every time I hit a new milestone in my career, I always got to give it up. To my day ones, my biggest fan, the terrible f men who hate me. <laughs> I mean, really, you're best known, right, for your TikTok takedowns, if you want to call them that, tackling the misogynistic bullies who post content that really is critical of women. When did you start posting these videos? I think I just saw so much misogyny platforms in such an open and honest way mm -hmm. that I had never seen before. I've seen lots of terrible stuff, obviously, and lots of wonderful stuff. But I had never seen such a proud, if you could call it that, display of bigotry in a way that was mm -hmm. like for fun. I had never seen anything like that before. So I thought to myself, like, if they're going to post it, then I'm going to respond to it. And it just kind of like snowballed from there. Who's going to tell him? You know? <laughs> and oftentimes those things are said about women online and nobody responds, right? So then they just yeah. keep saying them. So you're sort yeah. of holding people to account. Yeah, I, I've said that before. I'm, I feel like I'm one of the few creators whose platform stands on the shoulders of hate towards me specifically. My platform grows bigger every time I <laughs> openly platform men who say really horrible things to me. And I feel like a lot of times uh, women, especially women and femmes in general, are conditioned to take the high road, right? To ignore it, to, yeah. to forget about it, to leave it alone. Not me. When men tell me, they're like, you should get back to the O-line. They need you. I'm like, the hilarious part about that joke is like, I have more of a chance of making it than you do. <laughs> and that's the T. If you want a attention, then I'll give it to you on a worldwide stage. If that's really what you want. If you're bold enough to say it in private, you're, you should be bold enough to say it publicly. That's what I believe. So, and it turns out most of them aren't. Your influence has really caught on. I mean, all across TikTok. Uh, a lot of people have dubbed you the Crusader for Women. Is that a <laughs> title you wear proudly? Yeah, absolutely. As a, as someone who identifies as a woman, I feel like my my platform is a home for all marginalized people, whether or not they identify as men or women. Believe it or not, I do have fans that are men too. Uh, there's just not there's not as many as there are <laughs> other people, but uh, they are there. But um, it is a, a badge of honor and I feel very grateful and very humble that they've given that to me. The way I view it though, is you're coming back at certain negative comments, certain negative men. I mean, you are not a man hater, you know? Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a man hater. Um, I hate terrible men, but uh, even if I was, like if I was someone who, who did hate men for all the wrong they've either done to me or others, can you blame me? You know what I mean? What about some people that think sometimes you take it too far that don't appreciate your comments, sometimes think maybe even you're being a bully? I just think it's interesting to comment on other people's looks when you're ugly. Uh, well, I would say consider the source, right, of who, who says that, first of all. Um, the people who say that mostly are men who hate me. So uh, not a reliable source to ask them what they think about my methods. Because misogynists inherently believe that women are lesser than. They believe that they're not as smart. They believe they're not as funny. They're not as capable. They're not as competent. They don't take their word for anything. So what makes you think if I were to have an educational sit down conversation that they would listen to me? Has that worked ever? <laughs> no, it hasn't. Is that's what I always think like for women who have fought for progress for other women and femmes in this world, has anything ever been settled by being like, hey, can you please be nice to me? No. Right. Because when you're speaking to your oppressor, you have to speak in a language they understand. You've gained a following of nearly 8 million people. You were featured in Teen Vogue, Rolling Stone, recognized as Adweek's Digital and Tech Creator of the Year. I mean, mm. what an unbelievable journey this has been for you. And now you're getting ready to work on a project with Questlove? Yes, what? I'm writing a book. <laughs> you're writing a book with Questlove? Yes. <laughs> what is the book going to be about? I would say it falls in the category of self-help, so it's very much so a piece of my brain and my heart that I want people who understand what it is I'm trying to do, like the greater mission I'm trying to achieve. I want them to be able to have that and take it home and, and feel like if anyone is going to validate them, their anger, their, their frustration, their happiness, their joy, I want it to be me in a book form. You credit your strong Samoan culture for your <laughs> feminine energy. Who else are the strong female figures in your life? Is your sister one of them? Yeah, absolutely. My sister has always been a very like maternal um, figure to me. My mom is incredible and has been such a strong prime example of what it means to be an independent, strong woman who stands up for what they want and consistently like succeeds in life despite what other people may say. And part of being like, I think for some people anyway, having strong uh -huh. feminine energy also yeah. sometimes does come from strong relationships with men as well. You have that in your life? Yeah, absolutely. My father is, is very involved in my life and always has been. My parents are high school sweethearts. My dad has always been such a shiny example of what it means to, to truly be a man mm -hmm. in this. A uh, world my dad has never been afraid to tell us how much he loves us and show affection and show vulnerability and honesty. My dad has never been someone who has been like in the grips or the uh, entrenched in toxic masculinity. Like we, we always, we all have like misogynistic tendencies because we're raised in a patriarchal society, but we just, as adults, it's our job to unlearn it and unpack it. Do you feel like a lot of women turn to you when they're learning about self-acceptance. Do you find women coming to you on the social media platforms? Yeah, all the time. I think we can all agree that the meanest person that to ourselves is always us. Yes. Like I'm I'm the absolute meanest to myself more so than anyone ever could be because I'm the only one who knows me. So I feel like working on the internal as far as like how you talk to yourself, what you say to yourself is a great first step. When you spend time alone and you start to enjoy your own company, naturally what follows is how much you love yourself. Like you, you think you look awesome, you think you feel awesome. And then another great way as a shameless plug would be to buy my book when it comes on. <laughs> yeah, I would say to, to seek out community and to spend time alone and to work on how you talk to yourself more than anything. Those are just ways to get started. And I think naturally it will happen on its own. Our thanks to Kana Whitworth for that. And still to come here tonight, a Georgia man who has tried to see the Masters in person for more than a decade with no success. But his story of how he finally got there because of a mix-up in the mail when we come back. Name, image, and likeness, or NIL. The three magic words that have upended the landscape of college sports as we've known it. It's just 
the ability to make money through social media marketing. It changed everything. My concern is how is it handled? Critics will say people like yourself are buying these athletes. I mean, what do you say to that? Cashing in the debate over paying college athletes. Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, Yay. every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, a realtor in Atlanta has been trying to get tickets to see the Masters for 15 years, and he never could have guessed that a mail mix-up would be what helped him get there. Reporter Allison Mastrangelo from our partner station WSB has the story in the local lowdown. This is Scott Stallings, and this is also Scott Stallings. They're not related, they just share the exact same name. It was probably about five or six years ago when I actually saw him on TV and realized, uh, you know, wow, there's another guy that has my name, you know, playing golf. So every time I saw him on TV, I'd always take a picture of it and post it on Facebook. This Scott is a realtor from Atlanta, enjoying his first trip to the Masters as a patron, fulfilling a lifelong dream. I feel like we've uh, have just entered the adult uh, Walt Disney World. While the other Scott is a three-time PGA Tour winner, competing on the sacred Augusta National Golf Course for the third time in his career. Last New Year's Eve, their paths finally crossed when the invitation to play in this year's Masters was sent to the wrong Scott Stallings. The road to the Masters is long. Less uh, travel, for less sure. Less travel. <laughs> uh, just a chain of events that you couldn't write this stuff if you tried to. So Realtor Scott sent the invitation back to the rightful owner. And in return, golfer Scott hooked him up with tickets and an invitation to join him for dinner. It's just the excitement of receiving anything from Augusta National <laughs> and then, you know, kind of hearing you know, the back and forth of, of him thinking that that was his tickets. And it, it was a ticket, <laughs> I guess, yeah. just a different kind of ticket. But that's not all Scott gave him. He also surprised him with a once in a lifetime gift. Well, it turns out he framed the invitation and then signed it uh, saying from one one Scott Stallings to the next. And I, yeah. and I said, I can't believe it. It was just amazing. And uh, After all that, we got the invitation He said, back. I can't believe you're, you, can't, you can't part with this invitation. And he said, it's, it's done its job. Your last time, time here, so you're on your own after this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Our thanks to Allison. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Trevor Alden for Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, on the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com.